All right. Um, would Greg and Matt come on up and get seated, please? Uh, so happy to have Matt Goley and his family here with us today from Athens, Greece. Um, you know, when I was in seminary, uh, we kept talking about this 1040 window. Uh, you can Google it later or whatever, but basically it's the uh, the high unreached people groups, and we would constantly bemoan the fact, how in the world are we going to reach these people groups? I mean, these, these countries are closed. There's no way that we can reach them. And we prayed and we prayed. And I remember having all-night prayer sessions at, at one of the Bible schools that I was at, just praying. And um, uh, uh, a decade or maybe a couple decades ago, God started opening um, those doors up and saying, well, if you can't get in there, we're going to bring them to you. And, and believe me, he definitely opened up the floodgates. Uh, people have been coming in from those unreached countries and those unreached people groups um, into the West. And that is the ministry uh, that Matt and Greg uh, uh, work with right now. One of the ministries that's, that's receiving them and teaching them about the love of Jesus. So there are three people um, that are going to uh, speak today. Uh, first, we have uh, Matt Goley. Um, he him and his family have been in Athens, Greece for 13 years working with Hellenic ministries and uh, working among the refugee and the displaced people, people groups and uh, showing the love of Jesus and teaching them the love of Jesus. Uh, so he'll be speaking to you today. We also have Greg Dow, which you know has been a longtime member. He will be speaking to you today because him and Amanda have really, uh, they said yes to God a few years ago and said yes when they went over and saw the work and they've gotten really involved and they basically work full time right now with Hellenic as well um, because they listen to the voice of the Spirit, which is the third person that's speaking today. And that person, I want you to keep your ear out for. I, I want you to keep your ears open because uh, God not only is um, calling people from their country into a different place, but he calls us into different places with the, the gifts and the talents and the resources that we have as well to continue this work. So I don't know what God's going to say to you today, but I do know God will speak. Um, the Holy Spirit will speak in this conversation. So just keep your ear out. As they, uh, as they talk to hear and, and, uh, and listen to see maybe what your next step with Jesus needs to be. Um, so would you welcome uh, Matt Gully and Greg Dow. Good morning, everyone. I feel like I need to introduce myself because we spent six months out of the year and with COVID, I look around and I see so many new faces. So I want to welcome you, but really you're kind of welcoming me because you may have been here more over the last six months than I have. But anyway, uh, my name is Greg Dow and I'm here with my good friend, my brother and my fellow laborer, Matt Gully. His family is visiting us. Um, Matt heads up Oxio 113. It's the ministry we work with in Greece. You may have heard us talk about Hellenic Ministries. Hellenic Ministries is the parent organization. It's been around for about 40 years doing evangelistic work in Greece, and our group works with refugees. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk a little bit about um, stories and journey, mostly thinking about uh, the journey uh, and uh, the Bible's full of stories of journeys and stories about journeys. So we're going to start off with saying, Matt, welcome. Um, Thank you. We're all happy to have you yeah. here and Nikki and your, your, your family here. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you wind up in Greece? I mean, an Oki in Greece? I mean... Oki from Muskogee. Uh, yeah, he's actually <laughs> a legitimate Oki from Muskogee. Yeah. So thank you. Good to be together with you this morning. Uh, great to meet some of you earlier at the 9 o'clock uh, time, and some of you last night as well, as I look out. Um, yeah, that's a good question. My, my wife and I met at Harding University, and uh, never, actually I did think of going to Greece for studies, uh, didn't quite make that, we did go for a honeymoon. Uh, my wife is from Greece, so she grew up in Athens, uh, her dad is Greek, her mother's American, and... Um, and so for her honeymoon, you took her back home. Home, yeah. Who, who, who's done that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, okay, some of us here. <laughs> so Greece is a beautiful country, so we did go away from her house. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, but uh, that was a few years ago, uh, about 18 years ago. And um, yeah, we ended up in Atlanta working and 
taking groups of high school students to Greece on short-term mission teams, um, working with refugees in 2005, 6, and 7. And during that time, God called us to uh, return and work among refugees in Greece, uh, something we weren't looking at, something we weren't seeing in our future, uh, but God did that with us, and so we went in fall of 2008, and have been working with Hellenic Ministries since then uh, among many different people groups, uh, mainly Arabic and Farsi-speaking peoples from the Middle East and uh, Iran and Afghanistan. When you think about the Bible story, a lot of people wound up going somewhere different than they set out on their journey. I think it's interesting that you were done with university, college, you know, spending time overseas. Sometimes you start using different words. So you were done with university, um, and you were um, teaching, right? Both of you were teaching at the time with other plans and no real plan to go be a, a missionary. Right. And so, right. uh, you know, the Apostle Paul had one plan on the, the road to Damascus, and uh, God changed that. And I think we all have to think about our own journeys, that that happens. So as you were kind of on this journey and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, teaching, uh, you might kind of relay a little bit of the story that you relayed before of kind of how that calling, that direction, that directional change happened for you guys. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Really, it just came from interacting in a place and with a people that was very different from my roots in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Not a mosque around the corner, not a lot of Muslims walking uh, the street. Maybe there are now. I haven't lived there in a while, but I don't think so. Um, there are, on the other hand, a lot of Muslim refugees in Athens. And so our first trip in 2005, sitting down at a table with uh, two Afghans, I'll, I'll, Briefly, the, the first guy I met was actually from Iraq, and I'll tell you this story. Uh, went and shook hands with him. He had a big smile, and he said, are you American? I said, yes. He said, do you like George Bush? I said, uh. <laughs> he said, I love George Bush. I love America. I said, okay, good. <laughs> uh, you never know who you're meeting, you know, but uh, this guy was Kurdish Iraqi from northern Iraq, and, and they, he liked George Bush, so uh, that was nice. Um, anyhow, um, had a, a conversation with these two Afghan men, and one shared their journey of three months, one shared their journey of four months of walking to Greece. Uh, they're not neighboring countries. <laughs> There's quite a, a distance, uh, quite a travel they have to make uh, through uh, by foot and in vehicles being smuggled, being held sometimes locked in basements or locked in apartments, um, sometimes with guns. Uh, anytime you enter into the black market of things, you know, all rules go out and uh, families get separated. Every evil you can imagine happens uh, on the smuggling paths uh, to women, to children, um, and so a lot of theft, a lot of robbery, and so these guys had, had been through a lot, and they just shook my world of uh, understanding how different of a life experience some people have in, in this world. And, and uh, the other side of that was also their curiosity of this new place they were in, of uh, the church. Uh, they had wandered into a church and saw uh, what we just took part of, uh, the bread and the wine, and they asked, what, what does that mean? And so I found myself speaking with two Muslim men about the body and the blood of Christ and forgiveness and salvation and uh, eternal hope, uh, blessed assurance, th those things. And thought, you know, God, I think I could, I could do this a little more. And so that was the beginning of, of our journey to say, okay, maybe God's calling us to Greece uh, to work among these people. There were just a few people working at the time, some for many years doing great, great work, uh, laying foundations for the work that, uh, that we're doing now. Uh, but that was really the beginning of our, our call. Yeah, and that ties right into kind of the journey of the refugee. I mean, they have endured amazing trials, and their stories are riveting. Mm. One of the things we do is we, uh, as we run the discipleship training school, uh, one of the many Oxia ministries, um, is we interview people who want to come to our school, and so we ask them to tell us their story. And the stories are the most moving thing to hear 
of the difficulties and the atrocities um, that they have suffered. And so let's talk for just a minute. They start this journey, why? What are some of the reasons that the refugees we see coming to Greece started this journey? Yeah, we see many reasons. Uh, some are purely economic reasons. They're, they're just in a very uh, bad situation at home. I know that's the one that gets criticized the most uh, and legally criticized the most where they don't receive asylum papers uh, for those reasons. But uh, they're also leaving because of, of war and conflict, uh, either from extreme religious groups or from government or from uh, sometimes family uh, tribal feuding uh, that takes place. Uh, so there are many, many different reasons, especially among, as we speak about the Afghans and the Iranians. Uh, you occasionally see other, other stories that are, if they're on the fringe of society, or if they're just not accepted into an Islamic society, they, they will leave. And so we do have some Iranian Christians who were uh, a part of underground churches in Iran that have come out, and uh, they just weren't able to stay in the country any longer. Um, so there's the journey of, that starts of why they left. Um, and, and what's interesting is when, you, when, you, when we speak with refugees, we find out many of them would much rather be home if there was peace, they would rather be home. Uh, so anytime it comes to uh, speaking about, you know, the things they love, they're going to talk to you about uh, aspects of their culture, aspects of their country, uh, what, what was home. Uh, in many cases, they just, they're not able to do that in a secure way with their family anymore. Um, and so that things start in some way from some conflict, typically. Uh, their journey, they come through Turkey uh, most generally, and they find their way predominantly from Turkey to the Greek islands. Uh, the Greek islands, there are many. There are five uh, hot spots, as the, they've called them, five primary islands that they will go to. Even if they've come to smaller islands, they may be transferred to one of those five to the refugee camps uh, where they'll be held and processed. And once they receive their paperwork, uh, to uh, continue, they'll come into Athens or potentially another area of Greece. Um, it's, but it's very much like if we went around this room and we asked you about your stories, every single story is different. So you think refugees, because you hear the numbers and that they're all the same, it is so different. Some per religious persecution, but you would be surprised at the diversity. We have mm. bankers and former police officers who saw something, did something, and they had to flee for their own lives and the, the well-being of their families. But we have professionals that, yes, we also have the, the, the people at the other end of the spectrum who are just younger and just wanting a better future. And so their beginning points are very different. We have Shia and Sunni. And so if you're aware of the political realities of the world, we have people worshiping together, serving together, who came from backgrounds that I heard a story of two of the guys I know best over there laughing about, yeah, we, we, we wouldn't even talk to one another. We'd probably be trying to kill one another back home. Um, that's the amazing power of Christ, is he stitches us all together. And so he takes these refugees with all these different stories, and our ministry gets to play a small role in just trying to bring them to Christ. Mm -hmm. And just it, it is a privilege. We've talked about it mm -hmm. many times, uh, what a privilege it is to be able to be a part of that and to see the power of God changing lives. They started for one reason, but then they get to Greece, and they see a very different different story. Um, yeah, I think the, the, one of the things we see with that and even the challenges that we experience wherever we are in the world is recognizing the power of Christ to bring people together, mm -hmm. uh, to take down walls, to take down dividing walls, uh, whether that's ethnicity or uh, whatever those may be. Um, I think one of the things that we keep pressing into, we struggle with, uh, but we keep pressing into is this message of the oneness of the body of Christ. Mm. It seemed to be a predominant, passionate role in the heart of Jesus, right? Uh, if you look at John 17 and we see his prayer and he's praying for the complete unity. He's playing, praying that as we are made perfectly one, that the world will know that 
the Father sent the Son, and the world will know that God loves us as he has loved his Son. And um, we keep getting it wrong. <laughs> it, it's too easy to not give that the focus. And we, we face that in the challenge uh, with the church there. So many uh, times, you know, it's easier if you keep Afghans and Iranians separate because of their history, because of their cultural differences. They have some linguistic similarities and things that bring them together and history that brings them together. But for many reasons, it makes sense to keep them apart. But in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. there should be a place where those walls are brought down and we are seeing those transformative things happening among these people. Uh, and those challenges still exist and, and are present in the church now. It's not, it's not like you or I wake up one day and we're done with sin, right? We wake up every day and we need our new manna for the day. We need, our new, we need Jesus today and we need him tomorrow and we need him every day. And uh, that's the case of the church there. And that's the case of the church here. Right? I don't know what the challenges are in Georgetown, but the challenge I know for the body is always uh, to be one in Christ, to recognize the brotherhood, the family of God under the headship, the lordship of, of Jesus. So, I'll speak for me personally. I feel like what we see going on there is like the book of Acts reinvented. It's like we're living out the book of Acts. So you see Shia and Sunni and you think Jew and Gentile. I mean, they literally, two people groups that hated one another coming together in the body of Christ. And so I read those passages now with a new, new view of what would it be like to really be in that. And so do we have our differences? Sure we do. But when you really look at it, Christ brings us all together. And those differences, just like Jew, Gentile, Shia, Sunni, Iranian, Afghan, it should just disappear you know, because uh, we all have a country we're looking forward to. We have a destination we're looking forward to at, at our, in our journey that is beyond borders and is beyond this world. So they start out looking for a new place to live, and uh, they wind up beating Jesus, and everything changes. Their lives change. The transformation is amazing. Uh, maybe a story of something that's been me very meaningful to you, kind of a touching story or... Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking as you're talking about that, we, we just finished our, our summer camps. We do a camp for men and a camp for women. Uh, typically, we would do a family camp as well where we have families come out with children, but with COVID last year and this year, we, we couldn't do that with the COVID restrictions. So uh, we've invited the men and the women that are leading in the Persian Christian community, uh, so among Afghans and Iranians, uh, to come out for a week of camp and the week began, uh, we have uh, a group of leaders in the men's uh, camp in the, in the community that um, ha there are a lot of good relationships there, but there are a couple that, are, that were pretty strained. Um, and I know that's not a foreign concept uh, among churches. Uh, so th there were some relationships that were strained. And through the week, we saw um, a coming together I think what we saw was, was a, a coming down of pride, uh, a rising of, of uh, can you have a rising of humility? I'm not <laughs> yes, sure, but a but rising of carefully. humility and a coming together of these, uh, these men that culminated just even in the context of our conversation with the, uh, one of the Afghan uh, church leaders washing the feet of an Iranian church leader that there had been a known difficulty among, and they end embracing and kissing one another, um, which is culturally appropriate <laughs> among Persian-speaking people. And in Greece, it was a holy kiss, so it was even biblical. Um, and so just, just seeing, seeing that was not just about those two guys. It was about the community. It was about the example. It was about modeling. It was about uh, the same words of Jesus that I, you know, no, no, no student is above his teacher. These guys are mm -hmm. teachers in their community, and they're showing the way for their students to follow. They're teaching by example, and so... Well, I think there's something for all of us to learn. I want you to just imagine that there's someone in this room that you have something against or that you don't respect, or, and you go up to them, and you do what this brother did. He washed that person's feet, and he gave him a holy kiss. 
isn't that what Jesus tells us to do? Think about it. He washed Judas' feet right before Judas left the upper room to go betray him. He knew Judas was going to do that. And what did our master do? He washed that person's feet. That's so much of a better example than what we, the world tells us to do. The world tells us to go talk about that person, have anger or hatred against that person. And this brother gave such a great example to that whole group. But they all knew the story when he washed his brother's feet. It was like, wow, that's amazing. So I think what I see is I see the book of Acts playing out as we're over there among this people group who've never really heard of Jesus, or if they have, he's just a good prophet. Um, and they come to know him, and their lives are changed. And it challenges me to think about how can I change my life? Where do I need to take? You know, we talk about taking our next step. Where do I need to take my next step? And I have seen some really good examples. Um, what's one of the most challenging questions you've ever been asked? Because <laughs> teaching Bible classes to, to this group is a challenge because I tell you, they ask questions that you guys never asked me when I was teaching a Bible class here. <laughs> yeah, some, some of the questions. Um, if Jesus was God and he were and Jesus was crucified, and he died for three days, who ran the universe? <laughs> you ever think about that one? I never thought about that one. Um, another one, uh, a guy, this was uh, kind of a wild guy. Um, I don't think he was really a follower of Jesus, but he was passionately pursuing understanding, and he just couldn't understand how if the crucifixion story was true and God was the father of Jesus, how he could not have killed those Romans that, that beat his son, that humiliated his son, those Jews that yelled out at his son, how could he have not just killed them on the spot? And he asked me this with tears. And I thought, man, I never, yeah. I never looked at it that way. Uh, just, uh, it's a story I've always known you know, uh, from, from Scripture, but the concept of the Father God, how could he restrain his wrath and his, his anger against these men who killed his son? Um, you could go on and on. Yeah, yeah. Tr I, and, and Trinity questions. And Trinity questions. Uh, forgiveness questions, right? Forgiveness questions. Uh, it's yeah. one of the greatest struggles when you come from a culture that teaches an eye for an eye and a tooth for two, a tooth for a tooth, and you do to them before they do to you, and they come to a culture of love um, it is, they cannot believe that we have to forgive. And I'm teaching a Bible class, and I was asked, so I have to forgive the smuggler who separated me and my wife? I haven't seen her for two years, and I haven't seen my boys for two years, and I have to forgive that one? I'm like, the answer is yes, but let's talk about how that works. Anyway, some hard questions, mm. it really, really hard things, and it, it makes me at times feel like the things I get upset about are pretty small. <laughs> um, compared to what they have faced, what they're facing. But Jesus changes lives. My favorite toy story, I, sorry, I, Matt should be doing more of the talking, but I really want to tell you this one. You, you, these refugees want to get asylum. That's why they're there. They want this new home as part of their journey. And there's a couple that goes to the school that we work with in different capacities that are from Iran, and they both speak Arabic fluently. And so someone said, if you'll just lie and say you're from Syria, Syria is at war, you'll get automatic asylum. And they said, Jesus would not want us to lie. Man, that's like Jesus turned the stones to bread or Jesus kneeled down before me. And they, that's all they have to do is tell one lie and they would get asylum, the thing they want the most. And they say, Jesus would not want us to lie. <laughs> I mean... They had everything to gain, but they have come to know Christ. They're different people today mm. than they were. Um, Jesus was a refugee, right? Jesus was a refugee. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> uh, a lot of you did. Um, yeah, I, I, we look at the refugee story, and, and again, you know, I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I knew nothing about refugees growing up, but I knew nothing about Muslims growing up, but I uh, imagine uh, a lot more people are more aware of things now because of different, life is different. Um, but yeah, we see Jesus having to flee and seek refuge in Egypt uh, under threat 
of persecution under threat of death. We see the political leader at the time kill all the boys in his area um, under two years old. And they stayed in Egypt until that political leader was dead. And then God called them back. And we see that uh, as they came back to Israel, they were actually diverted and went to uh, Nazareth. Why? Because uh, Archelaus was still, was now in charge and he was afraid for his life. So even we see um, both international displacement and internal displacement of refugees, which we see today in uh, all over the world. Mm. Yeah. So uh, Je- Jesus is, a, is someone that uh, refugees can identify with. The Muslims know Jesus. Uh, we've had many that have come to us and say, we love Jesus. They just don't understand Jesus from the gospel. They, they, they understand Jesus from the Quran. They understand him as a prophet. Uh, there are many similar stories, uh, not the same similar stories. Jesus is born from uh, the Virgin Mary in the Quran. He actually speaks as an infant in the Quran and confirms his, uh, uh, you know, the, the honor of his mother, um, that, that he is special from God. But they do not recognize him as Savior, as Lord, as Son of God. Uh, and so they, they do not have a full revelation of, of who Jesus is. Um, and so that's uh, one of the things that we just love doing is, is finding out where people are in their understanding of Jesus and bringing them along through the Scripture and through the community. Mm-hmm. It's not just about Bible study. It's about uh, witnessing uh, the lives that are transformed. And so if you're asking me to come uh, join your family and leave my family, what does your family look like? What do you do? How do you treat each other? How do you live? How are your morals? Uh, how do you interact? And in effect, that's what is happening is when uh, many, uh, when many Muslims leave their Muslim faith, they are uh, like Abraham, leaving their country, their people. They're leaving uh, what they've known behind, and they are joining a new family. And their idea of family is often different. Mm. Uh, I, have, uh, I have two brothers. Well, I live in Greece. I live three, three, uh, three. I've lived three years away. 13 years away, but I hadn't been back in three years. I don't talk to my family a whole lot. Just, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are doing that or, well or not, but my, my siblings and I, we have a good relationship, but we don't connect a whole lot on the phone. We do when we come in person. Uh, but to be a brother in an Afghan family uh, is very different. Uh, if you have an Afghan family living together and there are five brothers and two of them have work, uh, they bring the money home, they share, they take care of things. There's a, a, an ex- expectation of the eldest brother to take care of the family, uh, to be there and, and support the father. There, there's all kinds of things that are different about being a brother in their idea of family. And so what does it mean to come and be a brother of Christ? Um, well, we have the text, we have our culture, we have all these things, but uh, they're looking to see how does the family of God interact with one another to know, am I not just giving my faith in Jesus, am I, am I good giving my life to this family? Um, so that's a big part of the journey of someone coming to faith in Christ. So um, we've talked about Jesus was a refugee. We know the children of Israel were told that, I mean, they went down to Egypt as refugees as well, I mean, trying to flee famine at the time. But you know what? We are too. Both Peter and then whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, I think it was Paul, both talk about us as pilgrims and sojourners. This is not our home. We're on a journey. And one of the things that's a mission of this church, the the mission of this church, is to help distracted people take the next step with Jesus. And so this morning, as we kind of wrap up here, what's your next step? Where, where are you on your faith journey? And so I think we should ask ourselves that kind of a question. It's like, what is it that I need to do in my walk with Jesus? We, we, we deal with these refugees, and they need to learn to forgive the person that betrayed them. That may not be different from where you are in your, your journey. It may be that your journey is what is my next move working in the kingdom of God. You know what your next step is in your journey. Take the next step.
Uh, what is the, the saying? I think it was Confucius, but the journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step. Reminds me of that old, old uh, song we all used to sing, you know, only a step. What is your next step? For these refugees, they take that first step, and that first step is Jesus. And it is so fantastic to watch their joy. But I want to tell you about their greatest sadness. Their greatest sadness that we just witnessed in one of our good brothers is when they have family members who are not Christian. And most of them, the majority of their family isn't Christian. I would say the mm. thing I'm asked to pray most often is pray for my family back in Iran, back in uh, Afghanistan, because they don't know Jesus. And I want to get them to know Jesus, and I want them to, to come to know that. And a good brother just lost his father who had not yet come to faith, and to see the crushing sadness. So I want you to know that, that people are coming to faith and that it is your work you support people like Matt. Mm -hmm. We support Matt and his family and their work, and they're bringing people to know our Jesus. They're coming to know our God. They're coming to know joy and have hope. But if you want to be praying for the work, pray for the families of these, these brothers and sisters of ours back, back in Iran and Afghanistan. Um, there's so much more we can say. We're out of time, uh, but we just want to end with that thought of what is my next step. You know, we come here to worship God. We come here to call one another to love and good works. Um, but we also come to reflect. So think about what is your next step? And please be in prayer for the ministry, for Matt and his family. Matt, thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank you all as well just for, again, we recognize it's not us out there doing the work. We do the work of God together with the family of God under the headship of Jesus, so we are participating together as much as you are praying with us, as much as you're supporting us, as much as you are with us in that, that sense. It's not uh, simply our work. Um, so thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, again, I, I said this earlier, but some of you have come up and said that you've been praying for us. We haven't met you until now. Uh, that's a blessing to us. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's very important to us. So thank you, and uh, please continue. And in all things, praise God. Uh, Matt will be at the back near the welcome desk if you want to come and talk to him afterward. And with that, Stephen, if you would lead us in a song. <laughs>